Russ gave an overview on the importance of mucosal healing with Crohn's. Now I'm going to tell you how we achieve mucosal healing in Crohn's. The other part of this talk, I'm going to provide a positioning in how I look at biologics and IBD, specifically in Crohn's, because often the question comes up, which one should we use first? How do we use these? How do we take into account things like safety? Uh, and then again, we'll end, uh, do the ARS questions, but then we'll switch right into cases and allow you to ask questions as well. So biologics and mucosal healing in Crohn's disease. Um, Russ already presented some of the preliminary data with anti-TNFs in mucosal healing, but then the other question is how do we actually position this uh, in Crohn's? So you may have seen this slide or heard of this concept today in the meeting, but we really are looking at the way we treat Crohn's disease differently than we had in the past. So for example, not too long ago, we used symptom-based control, and Russ started off the presentation with the old school way of treating disease. The problem is symptoms in Crohn's disease are fairly unreliable in terms of bowel healing. You may hear at this meeting PRO, so I don't know if you haven't heard the term PRO, patient reported outcomes, in Crohn's disease, we now distill down to two symptoms, diarrhea and pain. PRO2, patient reported outcomes to an ulcerative colitis, bleeding and diarrhea. So if you hear PRO2 at the podium, that's what we mean. But then we're evolving into endoscopic remission, endoscopic healing, and in Crohn's disease, Russ already mentioned, sometimes we need to use cross-sectional imaging. But this concept of endoscopic remission has been applied to ulcerative colitis, but now we're looking at this in Crohn's disease, including histology. So the ultimate target for healing may actually be histologic improvement. I'm not here tonight to say that we should heal every cell we see. I don't think that's practical. And in a way, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. So I think at some point, we can take a patient with very bad disease get them much better, and that's probably okay without switching to the next agent. Russ already showed you the accent data. I'm not gonna go through this again, but just showing that the anti-TNFs do heal the mucosa in Crohn's disease, um, not only with infliximab, but now with adalibumab. And so there was a difference in terms of adalibumab healing at a short period of time, week 12, and then out to week 52. Seratolizumab, the third anti-TNF approved for Crohn's disease, also showed mucosal healing. So these are old data, not something new tonight. Russ also mentioned the post-operative studies, which we know now that the deepest remission we can induce in Crohn's disease is to actually do a resection. And some of your patients will actually come in and say that this is absolutely the best they have felt ever in years because that segment has been resected. The question is, we know there's a recurrence. So if we look at mucosal healing as a surgically induced remission, the question is how do you keep somebody there? And this is the uh, post-operative study that we did uh, several years ago comparing infliximab to placebo, infl and this is recurrence rates after surgery. Now moving to some of the newer agents, vedolizumab. So we've talked about vedolizumab for Crohn's, and I think that there's a myth somewhat out there that vedolizumab doesn't work in Crohn's disease, or it doesn't work as well. Maybe it doesn't heal the mucosa. Well, there are data that vedolizumab not only induces clinical remission, but it's been shown to induce an endoscopic remission and complete mucosal healing, and you can see the blue versus the gray uh, for placebo. There's also been comparative effective studies. So you've heard of this for ulcerative colitis, and we don't have comparative effective prospective studies yet in Crohn's, meaning where we take one biologic and compare it to the other and go forward and see outcomes. However, this is a, uh, a study where they actually looked back. It's a victory consortium where they looked at data in vedolizumab. You can see in the one column for clinical remission, steroid-free remission, and endoscopic healing and compared it to an anti-TNF in Crohn's disease, and actually found that vedolizumab had a significantly higher 12-month rate of endoscopic healing. So vedolizumab does work in Crohn's. It works for not only symptoms, but it has shown mucosal healing. 
Ustekimumab, the, the newest in terms of Crohn's disease, and as you know, Ustekimumab was just approved for ulcerative colitis, but these are the data in Crohn's disease showing endoscopic outcomes at week 44 in the UNITY study with Ustekimumab. And again, you can see without going through all the data that was there a significant difference in terms of endoscopic response and mucosal healing. So looking at the two blue arrows on the right-hand side and was statistically better uh, than placebo. Now, the Eustachimumab data also showed that there was a decrease in certain scores um, that was significant between those treated with Eustachimumab compared to placebo. So one of the questions becomes, how do we position all of these agents? And I put in a box up here three that are approved for Crohn's, so the anti-TNFs, the anti-integrin, anti-L1223. I'm not going to touch on the JAK inhibitors for Crohn's. So far, JAK inhibitor, um, specifically tofacitinib, did not show a benefit in the Crohn's study, but stay tuned as there will be uh, selective JAK inhibitors in the future being evaluated for Crohn's disease. Well, you've heard today guidelines and pathways, and the AGA uh, and other societies have come up with pathways for Crohn's disease, which simply put in certain symptoms and objective criteria and split patients into low risk and high risk. One thing I'll say up front, ulcerative colitis seems to come in two flavors, or two groups, if you will, that are about evenly split. Low risk for progression to colectomy are patients who generally respond to mesalamine. You all see these in your practice. These are not patients we talk about at the conference too much because they're doing extremely well with a mesalamine product. And maybe they've taken one or two courses of steroids over their treatment span, but for the most part, these are not refractory. And ulcerative colitis, 50% are more refractory, more likely to get colectomy. They need biologics. Well, in Crohn's disease, it might be hard to read, but Crohn's, we think that 75% of Crohn's patients are already more aggressive when they present. And it may be that Crohn's disease is a silent disease for a long period of time until you make the diagnosis. So how many times in your practice do you do a colonoscopy on a patient who with Crohn's disease say they have symptoms for two months? and you look at them and they already have strictures or deep ulcers or very severe disease, usually in the ileum or the right colon, they've probably had disease for years that was clinically silent until it presented with this end-stage disease that we see and diagnosis Crohn's disease. So 75%, that blue box, 75% of patients require more aggressive treatment, and we've shown that earlier aggressive treatment is better in terms of healing the mucosa, but also the tissue repair. So the anti-TNFs, vedolizumab currently, and ustekimumab, and we can talk maybe on the panel whether we use these agents in combination or not. I'll just give you my little prelude for this. When I start an anti-TNF now, I always start combination therapy, whether it be with a thiopurine or a methotrexate, primarily because of the immunogenicity. However, when I start vedolizumab or ustekimumab, I generally start monotherapy, and I do not use combination. Now, this is an ulcerative colitis study, but we wanted to show this because I mentioned a minute ago uh, the Victory Consortium. This is the first comparative effective study we have on two biologics in ulcerative colitis. So the orange is vedolizumab, the blue is adalizumab. And you can see differences in terms of vedolizumab superior to adalibumab in the terms of treatment for ulcerative colitis. One of the other aspects is that we need to take safety into account. So we've done a lot of work on safety and looking at this, and there's a, a safety pyramid that you may have seen that we published uh, this earlier this year for inflammatory bowel disease. And this isn't meant to be completely evidence-based, but more of a visual guide on how we look at positioning the biologic therapies. So you can see vedolizumab and ustekimumab both are pretty much on top. Both are what we would consider the safest biologic. It doesn't mean that that necessarily should be the biologic you start, but these are what we would consider the safest. I've modified my safety pyramid a bit because I do think that now ustekimumab has more data and vedolizumab I'd still put on top, but I'd put both of them in the top box. But what we can't forget is that steroids are at the bottom. 
And if you have patients who are stuck on steroids for a long period of time, that is probably in terms of damage or, or uh, danger, if you will, probably the least safe of the medicine. The other thing we need to keep into account, and we don't think of this as a side effect, but under treatment. So the patient then has active, not just a little bit of active disease. I mentioned a minute ago, can we heal every last little ulcer we see in Crohn's? Probably not. But if they have deep ulcers, very inflamed segments of bowel, especially multiple segments of bowel, these are the patients, even if they're telling you that they don't have symptoms, these are the ones that ultimately require surgery. And if they have a long segment of small bowel resected, these are the ones that you're now seeing in your offices with short gut or short bowel syndrome, and they're really struggling. So inadequate treatment I would put as another potential adverse event to under treatment. <clears throat> Well, we also know that patients, Russ mentioned a minute ago, from a health economic standpoint, under treatment, flares, hospitalizations, and ulcerative colitis, cancer, uh, and surgery. One thing we shouldn't forget, and we talk about it with ulcerative colitis, but patients who have a large inflammatory burden with Crohn's disease, so multiple segments, jejunum, ileum, colon, these are patients who have higher risks for clots. We talk about clots a lot in terms of treatment, but we can't forget that inflammation itself is a risk factor for clot. And when we admit patients, especially ulcerative colitis, but I would submit those that have extensive inflammation into the hospital with Crohn's disease, we probably should be using low molecular weight heparin or some type of uh, anticoagulant uh, preventative measure. So how do we position these? And this is kind of my attempt to put them into the three buckets of treatment, anti-TNF, anti-integrin, IL-1223. And again, this is Crohn's, so that's why you're not seeing small molecules on here. Well, if you were to consider the anti-TNFs on the far left, well, what are the options now? We have intravenous, so you have subcutaneous. We know these work quickly. Uh, we also know, in a minute ago, I mentioned that these are work best with a combination therapy, so the sonic study using combination therapy with a thiopurine. However, there are side effects that can occur with these, and I probably would list the side effect of most importance would be infection. We always talk about, and Corey's done a lot of work in looking at lymphoma, we always talk about lymphoma and cancers, but really when I would think about anti-TNFs as a side effects, really infection is probably the one. And pneumonia, pneumococcal pneumonia is still what we probably see as the most common uh, infection, so we should vaccinate our patients. So that's anti-TNFs. What about vetalizumab in Crohn's disease? Well, there's the IV formulation. Soon, probably quarter one of next year, there will be a subcutaneous formulation coming out. And you've may, you haven't heard yet at this meeting, but I think on Monday there will be a plenary session presentation on um, subcutaneous vetalizumab. We've talked about vetalizumab maybe being a little bit slower, but in Crohn's disease, some of the studies have shown as early as two weeks there is a benefit and a response. Obviously, if the patient is biologic naive, so if you're using vetalizumab as first line for Crohn's disease, it works better. There's low immunogenicity, so interestingly, as I mentioned a minute ago, we're using as the first line agent monotherapy vetalizumab without combination and it is gut selective and it has an excellent safety profile. People say, well, when do you use 6 MPAs of thioprin methotrexate with vetalizumab? And in my practice, if it's our third or fourth biologic and they're antibody formers to the other ones that came before, so they have this tendency to form antibodies, that's when I will use combination with betalizumab. Or if it's a very refractory patient and I'm looking for two different mechanisms of action to treat their Crohn's disease, I may use combination. Otherwise, it works very well in monotherapy. Similarly, used to kimumab is a, has generally been an agent I've used as monotherapy. Also is given, as you know, induction IV and then subcutaneous every eight weeks. It also has a fast onset of action. It has shown benefit in both naive and refractory to anti-TNF patients. Uh, it also has a safety profile that's excellent. So as of today, there's no black box warning for use to kimumab either. Very low immunogenicity, uh, and it's good also for psoriasis. So for extra intestinal manifestations, especially things like psoriasis, you know that this has been FDA approved. 
So I'll end with this slide. This is kind of what I do in my practice. And, and again, I put up there in italics, insurances often dictate what we can use first. So probably all of you in your practices encounter this every day where you have an agent or medicine you want to start, but you can't start it because you're told that that's not covered and you have to step through a different medicine first. And maybe that will change someday, but the cost equation is obviously there. So for any disease, any age, and I'm putting ulcerative colitis, I'm just gonna give you my overall IBD. Any age hospitalized you see, generally I am still using infliximab as my first line agent. So that really sick patient who's coming into the hospital. Um, and I am using combination therapy. If they're young males, I tend to use more methotrexate. If it's been a loss of response to an anti-TNF, and especially if it's been a subcutaneous anti-TNF first for Crohn's, and they've done well and they lose response, I do generally, and I have switched to the IV formulation in Fliximab. However, if it's a patient who's responded to IV and Fliximab and has done well over time, has good levels, and then develops antibodies, I have generally, and I'm curious to hear what uh, Corey and Russ do, I've generally then switched out of class. Now, I will tell you that I don't have any data to support that, but I think something about infliximab, especially the dosing, going to a sub-Q I wonder about, but probably many of you in the room would go to an, a sub-Q anti-TNF, and I don't think that could be faulted. If it's a primary loss of response, meaning never, ever got better with whatever anti-TNF, good levels after induction, and they're still suffering, then I will switch out of class. Ulcerative colitis outpatient and Crohn's disease outpatient really look about the same. The difference with Crohn's disease is I consider whether they have a fistula. So if it's a one segment of the bowel Crohn's patient without a fistula, generally I'm using vedolizumab or ustekimumab as my first line. Remembering again the insurance piece I said a minute ago. However, if they have extensive multi-segment uh, bowel, jejun, ileum, uh, colon, especially if they have bad perianal fistula, and I'm looking for my first agent, I am using infliximab in combination for that patient, because I still think the data are supported the most with that. How about um, extraintestinal manifestations? Well, I think we need to split them in. Do you think the extraintestinal manifestation would get better if you healed the bowel? Or do you think the extraintestinal manifestation runs a separate course independent of healing the bowel? So if you think it's an extraintestinal manifestation that's secondary to bowel inflammation, so peripheral arthritis, iritis, erythema nodosum, quite honestly, any biologic that you use that heals the bowel will work. It doesn't really matter. However, there are some specific ones, pyoderma gangrenosum, uveitis, central arthritis. These are probably where anti-TNFs have the most data. You know, our rheumatology and dermatology and ophthalmology colleagues have shown us that anti-TNFs work in those. Um, we wonder about ustekimumab. Maybe there's some benefit extraintestinal, um, but I think if you had to use a first-line agent and they had one of these, pyoderma, uveitis, central arthritis, I would probably reach for an anti-TNF agent. Now, I didn't put primary sclerosis and cholangitis up there. There were some early data thinking that anti-integrins would work for that. Unfortunately, the studies to date with vedolizumab have not shown a benefit for PSC. We got really excited initially because Vito is probably taken up in the uh, biliary tree, or I should say the alpha integrin um, probably works in the biliary tree, but we have not found yet, at least as today, any of our standard medications work. And then finally, pregnancy. Um, there have been several talks, or you'll hear several talks at this meeting, and you've certainly heard several over time. Generally, obviously, methotrexate's contraindicated. We've said that probably multiple times. Tofacitinib, right now, I'm not recommending in pregnancy. I know Uma Mahadevan is, is looking at this as our other groups. Generally, I try to have the patients off this for about three months, but I will mention tofacitinib has an incredibly short half-life. It probably clears the body in 12 to 24 hours. Now, one thing to keep in mind with tofacitinib is a little pearl. If the patient has um, poor kidney function, renal function, 
creatinine's elevated, they'll have a slower clearance because it is renally cleared. But I'm not using tofacitinib in pregnancy. Maybe second, third trimester tofacitinib is going to be okay. I think today, though, I would not recommend that. However, all the MABs, so infliximab, adalibumab, vetalizumab, ustekimumab, I would use in pregnancy uh, as well. So with that, thank you very much for your attention.